Professor Mary Kalansis was born in 1949 in a small village in the Peloponnese. Mary arrived with her family in 1953 as one of the first Greek families to sail to Australian shores as part of the assisted migration program. Mary recalls that her parents were rarely at home as both worked long hours at multiple jobs. As a young girl, Mary's thirst for knowledge began to consume her and she compensated for what she lacked in her own home life with a fascination of books and a determination to read as many as she possibly could. As her ambitions soared, an arranged marriage failed because she refused to accept the traditional wifely stay-at-home-and-cook role. She then followed her dream and went to Macquarie University, achieving a Bachelor of Arts with honours and a Diploma of Education with majors in History and Linguistics. After graduating, Mary's career began to blossom. She has had numerous roles, such as Dean of the Faculty of Education, Language and Community Services at RMIT, President of the Australian Council of Deans of Education, a Commissioner of the Australian Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, Chair of the Queensland Ethnic Affairs Ministerial Advisory Committee and a member of the Australia Council's Community Cultural Development Board. Today she is both a successful author and world-acclaimed academic, currently acting as Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States. She continues to have a deep interest in the development and history of multiculturalism and the impact it has had and continues to have on Australian society. We grew up in uh, Erskineville in, in, the, in Sydney in a tiny little house uh, opposite the railway and we had no yard, I remember that much and all there was was this little corner shop that we used to go to so my mother used to take us regularly uh, to Hyde Park, that used to be an outing for us and we'd walk through the trees and we'd go there regularly and always, always we'd end up at the Archibald Fountain. And if you know the Archibald Fountain, you know it's uh, the statues of classical Greek uh, imagery. And uh, my mum would go there and say, this, this represents, uh, uh, you know, Greece. This represents where we come from. And she, mostly she'd talk about, I think there was a ram and a goat. She'd go to the, to the animals and, and, you know, talk about the animals when, that she had when she was growing up. But she didn't know the classical stories, but she knew it was connected, something to something that was special to her that she could talk to us about. So, you know, there was Diana with the bow and arrow and Apollo and, and uh, it was uh, very uh, poignant for us because in Australia, that was the way she connected with us about what mattered to her. My earliest memories of school uh, were uh, ones of um, being different in a, in, as a consequence of the fact that we were poor, really, if I was to think about it now. Like, we, we didn't have uniforms, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, I had a hand-me-down tunic uniform, you know, the ones with the, with, the, uh, with the pleats in them. But the one I had didn't have a belt, so I remember going to school feeling everybody else had a belt, but my mother didn't realise the importance of having a belt, so we'd go without that. And not having English initially was a very big problem because I could communicate at home, I was a smart, clever little girl at home, but when I went to school I was not a smart, clever girl, I was somebody who was dumb. And the third part of that early experience was my mother, who was a stylish lady, right, liked to, liked to make us look as best as we could, and the only thing she could do, given that we didn't have clothes and nice shoes, is fix our hair. <laughs> so she used to put our hair in this little roll, right at the top of your, your head, this little roll, and we'd go to school, it was unlike the hair anybody else ever had. So the kids would laugh and mock us and we'd go back and say, Mum, you can't do this anymore. So there was a little bit of a kind of a distance. My parents never went to school, so they didn't know what the culture of school would expect. Um, so that was um, the initial uh, experience. But as uh, schooling became, um, you know, as I I went through the different grades, I have to say it became a window into what you might call the knowledge of the Australian world as a set of stories, not as a set of lived experiences. 
So school for me was always the place where I wanted to be because it enabled me to find out things about the world. I was the first daughter, right, and, and first children are very much prized in, well, they were in my family. So, you know, I knew I was loved, I knew my family regarded me highly, so I had a very strong, positive self-image. The fact that that didn't transfer directly uh, to the adults in the school context just puzzled me. It was a puzzle. I didn't think that their judgment of me was correct because I had such a strong kind of nurturing environment at home. So I just decided to solve it myself and I knew, I don't know how I knew this because we didn't have a single book in our house, a single newspaper, a single magazine. Somehow I knew that these things called books carried magic <laughs> and I had to unlock that magic. And the only thing I could do given that the school in my elementary years couldn't help me, my you know, primary years couldn't help me, there was a wonderful library at Campsie, a public library. And I made a decision that I would start on the right-hand side of that library and get to know every single book on the shelf. And it was through books, I have to say, and the radio. I used to listen to the ABC um, and the, pra the radio was the other entree into knowledge. My parents were uneducated, illiterate, both of them. So the school didn't understand my needs, so these other forms, public radio, public libraries, <laughs> were the means by which I had access to a world beyond the one my school offered me or mediated for me and that my home could offer me. They were hardly there. That's the first thing. As a child, you know, my mother worked, my father worked. <laughs> You know, you might nowadays call us latch, latchkey children, but you know, I would come home, the house would be locked, I'd sit on the veranda, I'd wait for mum to come home from the job she had, and dad wouldn't come home till late at night. So, you know, we weren't quite sure what they were going through. But when I asked them, uh, they actually, what they say is that Australia provided them with opportunity because they came here for a better life and they measured that in material terms. And for the first decades of their lives, buying a house, buying a second house, having nice clothes, uh, being able to have a car, buying a television, that seemed to be worth the trade-off um, that immigration uh, uh, you know, required of them. I think now in later life they look back and they're not quite sure whether the trade-off was as... Um, as uh, sufficiently satisfying as they thought because they have the houses, they have the property, but somehow they missed out on growing up with their children. Um, our families are dispersed because that's part of modern life. They're far away from their own roots. And I don't know that they, they now think of it as, as, as uh, positive as they did when they were struggling to succeed and they, sh and they saw success in terms of those new material things they could buy that they couldn't have when they were back in the village. Now, our family was a poor immigrant family that was involved in the chain migration process. You know, my family was sponsored and they sponsored. And that created a very, very rich community life. There'd be streams of people coming off the boats when we were young to our home. My, my parents would rent out rooms to them. There'd be parties, there'd be arranged marriages, there'd be, you know, it was a full-on social life. And in that context, when you're emotionally fulfilled in this sociality, you don't notice that you've never been on a holiday and you'd go to school and kids would go on holidays. So you think, oh, what's a holiday? <laughs> you know, like you get in a caravan or a car and you'd go somewhere. And I thought, hmm, that was an interesting idea, but we, we never went on holidays. You know, we'd visit our relatives, but there was never the idea that you'd take a holiday, for example. Um, and, but it, the fact that the, the cultural and emotional life was so rich, I think in my case anyway, I didn't feel that we missed out on anything. Uh, what, what I felt I was missing was my home life and my public life somehow being more visible 
or more intertwined because it was really going into two separate... When I was growing up, your, my public life was school life because I wasn't allowed to have friends, right? You know, you, your relatives were trustworthy, your friends were not trustworthy, you know, so... And you wouldn't waste your time with friends that couldn't reciprocate, whereas the family would re reciprocate and look after you. So Australian life, when you're a child, is only accessed through school and your rest of your life is accessed through your home. And it was the richer environment, of course, with cousins and uncles and, you know, weddings and birthdays and name days. So I, I didn't actually feel I was deprived of anything from my Greek side, but I did have a yearning to understand more of the life that I experienced through school that m might have been uh, what other people thought was Australian. I thought my life was Australian. I thought being Australian was uh, singing Greek songs, eating moussaka, you know, going to name days. That was being Australian because I did it in Erskineville, I did it in Campsie, I did it in Ryde, I didn't do it in Athens. So I always thought I was Australian. It's just that we did these ordinary things with this kind of flavour, you know, that other people labelled as Greek. But it wasn't Greece. It was in Australia. So I don't know if other people felt like that, but I always felt very strong in my family and my identity as a Greek. But I, I thought that was being Australian at the same time. Growing up in, in the kind of family that I grew up, you know, being a good girl mattered, right? I had imbibed all that, you know, you wanted to be a good girl. You know, Australia was a place of danger to my parents. My parents never encouraged us to be Australian. They, they always thought Australia, although it offered them opportunity, was hum, somehow less to them, to them, because they thought it was promiscuous, it was loose, they didn't work hard. You know, they had these kind of ideas that Australia and Australian people, because they used immigrants in the way that they used, were not prepared to work like the immigrants were prepared to work. And somehow that their families weren't as connected and, and extended and reciprocal, right? So they did see that there was something in Australia that was less in cultural terms than what it was to be Greek. So they wanted to preserve what it was to be Greek and they had to protect us, particularly the girls, because the girls carry the family in their mind. You know, the men make the money, but the women and the girls maintain family and culture. And so what you do is you make sure that they marry within the same community. And because I married at 17, my dream to go on and get an education was cut short. And so as a young mother with two children, I, I had never given up that dream. I used to collect from my friends their reading lists from university. I, I was desperate to go to university to get formal education. And luckily for me, I think it was the Whitlam government um, eliminated fees to university. And I remember in, being in the backyard hanging up clothes and the radio announced that fees would be eliminated. And so I went to my family and said, this is, remember, we're still poor. <laughs> I said, it's not going to cost anybody anything if I go to university. Could I please uh, be allowed to, um, to find out what's possible for me? So we had a family council, and the family council decided that, you know, Mary's unhappy, she always wants to do this, we'll let her go and do it. So they allowed me to go to community college in order to matriculate, to get to university. But what that did is created for my husband, my then husband, a problem about what kind of woman I would become with this knowledge and what kind of woman I would be when I was in a public sphere mixing with other people, particularly access to other men, which would cause dangers. So that produced a tension in our, in our family. And in fact, my husband left me in order that I come to my senses and return to being a good woman. I never felt other than 100% Greek and 100% Australian. Now that's bad math, but that's how I felt, <laughs> you know. 
You can't be one thing or the other. You can't be half this or half that. You are fully all things and in different contexts that plays out. So I never lost what my family gave me, right? I never lost that. I never lost a love for uh, Greek food or Greek music or uh, feeling a special affinity when I, I meet somebody of Greek background. I, I never lost it. How, how could I lose that? I, I never wanted to rebel against it. I never wanted to resist it. It was just part of who I was.